and welcome. This is Pam. I'm going to be covering a really interesting topic today. So I have a whole bunch of different angles to cover, but I wanted to first start with a study that I found. It was published in 2021, and it showed that a malaria drug significantly helped people with primary progressive multiple sclerosis. So we're going to talk about their findings, what this really means for MS, because it's not a cure, but it gives us more clues. And then since I've been researching further, I have found many other connections. And so what I really believe is that all the evidence that I've collected over the last couple of days is really helping us to see that a, a, a malaria, it's a protist type. So whether it's Babesia, malaria, but it's some type of a single cell parasite is commonly found in multiple sclerosis patients. And when they're treated, they notice significant symptom improvements. So that's really huge. So if we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis over 30 years ago. And by the grace of God, I learned very early on that multiple sclerosis was caused, is caused by chronic infections in the body. And as these infections are treated effectively, the MS stops. And so since then, I've had the wonderful privilege to live MS-free for over 30 years. And I've also coached over a thousand wellness champions from over 15 countries in their recovery. So what my goal with these training videos is really to help people to see there is a lot of research showing that MS is caused by various infections, just a few of them significantly there is hope. We don't have to live with this disease. It's not a mysterious disease that's just taking over our body. But there is real hope if we treat the cause. And you will find what I have collected today or this week so incredibly fascinating. So this 2021 study showed that the drug hydroxychloroquine, it, it's a malaria treatment, and it was associated with slowing down the progression of primary progressive multiple sclerosis. And this is important because for primary progressive, well, we know that the MS drugs don't work anyhow, but they don't offer a lot of treatments for primary progressive. And so when you find something that actually makes a difference, and I would suspect that this would probably help MS patients even more than our disease-modifying drugs also, because it's probably treating one of the common parasites that we have when we suffer with multiple sclerosis. So let's talk about the study. Well, actually, before we do, I just wanted to share too that, like, what is malaria and what is Babesia? They are types of protists. So there are single cell parasites. They're like one cell. They're not a bacteria. They're different from bacteria in their structure. For example, they have, they're called eukaryotes and that's like our cells. And I'm not gonna get too heavy into the biology, but basically it is a type of parasite. You may have heard of Giardia before. Maybe you have heard of um, malaria, Maybe you've heard of Babesia. These are all different single-celled parasites that cause disease in humans. And so if you want to learn more about the link between Babesia and multiple sclerosis, make sure to visit our Live Disease Free YouTube channel. And there you will see a video that I talked about research linking MS and Babesia. So before I go any further, I just, for the people that are new, we know from all the research that I've pulled together and also what the current research is showing us, and I've covered lots. So the studies that are coming out in the last less than five years, they're, they're seeing and finding that people with multiple sclerosis but other chronic diseases like ALS, PLS, Parkinson's, all these chronic diseases, they all of us that are dealing with these diseases are in a state of dysbiosis, so we're really out of balance. We have too many disease-causing microbes and not enough health-promoting microbes. And I wanna start with that so that you understand, I'm not saying that a certain protist is the only cause of MS, and if you take hydroxychloroquine, you're gonna get healed. No, we want to take the clues from this research. They're very, very powerful clues. Connect them with other things throughout the history of 
of different researchers and doctors treating MS and seeing common threads and seeing, and that really is science, that this is the ongoing process of science. So again, I'm not saying that MS is caused only by a protist, but I'm saying that there's a lot of evidence that shows that protists are probably, and maybe it's a specific one or two that are probably very commonly causing a problem and a lot of the MS symptoms. So again, I have a video on multiple sclerosis and Babesia in our Live Disease Free YouTube channel, so make sure to go and watch that later. And we're gonna talk more about just protists in general, but the Babesia, malaria, or whatever this new type of uh, protist is. So protists are single cell parasites. They are different than bacteria. They are classified as a eukaryote, so they have they're, they have more similar structure to our cells, for example, in humans versus a bacteria. But they're single cell. And we talked about Babesia, Malaria, Giardia. There are other kinds of protists that cause sickness. But the ones we're talking about are ones that are transmitted by mosquitoes. And for example, Malaria and Babesia, they will infect our red blood cells. So we can see changes in our blood uh, test results that we get back from our doctor. So please be aware with all the students that we've worked with that it might not be that every, this is too early to say, that every single person with multiple sclerosis has a protist infection. We know that flarial worms can cause those little tiny roundworms in the central nervous system, which are present according to Dr. Alan McDonald's findings, that they can also cause all of these neurological symptoms. So it's kind of more like if there's a specific infection in the central nervous system, wherever it's located, it can cause specific neurological symptoms. And so with these protists, they do infect our red blood cell. They do give us all kinds of symptoms. But once the red blood cells are infected, they can cross the blood-brain barrier and they end up in our central nervous system. And then they are called cerebral infections, like cerebral uh, malaria, for example. And then we have much more serious symptoms. So let's look at this study from 2021. I believe it was published in September. And I just want to give a shout out to the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada, because they have been putting out some really good research on multiple sclerosis and the microbiome and dysbiosis and parasites and toxins produced by bacteria. So we want to follow these kind of researchers because they are on the right track. And that's what we're looking for is we're looking for research that is not just going to more disease modifying patented expensive drugs that we have to take forever and we have to become more and more disabled and live with our disease. It's awful. So we want to go where the research is pointing in the right direction. And, and there's a lot of re good research coming out of the University of Calgary that I've noticed in the last year or so. So they studied, it's a small group, right? It's not a huge, I think there was about 40 participants and they were screened really well, et cetera. And so they were given hydroxychloroquine and of course there's a control group that doesn't get the drug. And they found that their conclusion, oh, and I wanted to say too that they were giving the amount of hydroxychloroquine that I believe that you would give to somebody with uh, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. So people that have rheumatoid arthritis and, and lupus, they are given kind of a low maintenance dose, ongoing maintenance dose, and it really helps them a lot. It doesn't cure their disease either. We'll talk more about the significance of that, but it is a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis and for lupus. So it's about 200 milligrams twice a day, and that was given over, I think, about 16 months. And the anti-malarial drug hydroxychloroquine, it reduces the activity of, and, and I want to, this is what they say in science, it reduces the activity of our microglial cells. So those are your immune cells that are fighting infection. So is it that it's reducing their activity or is it that it's treating the infection so then our immune cells don't have to work as hard? That's probably closer to the truth. And it also has neuroprotective uh, property, so protecting our neurons in vitro. So that's in 
the lab, not in vivo, in vivo is when they're testing things in, in the human body. So in the study, they gave people the medicine, that's in vivo. And in vitro, they have noticed that hydroxychloroquine has neuroprotective properties, protecting the nerve. So for example, again, if you're treating infection that's causing inflammation, that's causing nerve damage, and you treat those infections, that would be neuroprotective. So this is where sometimes we have to read between the lines of the science and really help to understand what it means. So they were giving 200 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine. I mean, you can talk to your doctor about trying this if nothing else is working, but I've got some better solutions for you at the end also. So 200 milligrams twice a day, hydroxychloroquine. You can find this study. Uh, the study name is the title, and I'm, we always post a blog post. So I'll take this video, I'll take the recording of it, and we will put it on our blog post. So I do a little write-up. So if you prefer not to listen to long videos, you can just do a quick reading of the write-up that I have. So it'll be in written, it'll be in video. So people that are hearing impaired or visual impaired, you can do either or. And that is on our livediseasefree.com. And that's usually published on Thursdays and Fridays. And if we do, we do publish newsletters. So make sure you get on our list so that you can receive our newsletters because that way you're gonna be up to speed on just really understanding the types of infections that cause MS and how we are recovering from these infections as quickly as possible. So again, the study is called hydroxychloroquine for Primary Progressive Multiple Sclerosis, 2021, out of the University of British Columbia. And 40 participants, they gave them 200 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine for about 18 months, twice a day, I believe. And their conclusion, they found that in people with primary progressive multiple sclerosis, hydroxychloroquine treatment was associated with reduced disability worsening. So the disease did not worsen, the disability did not become as strong as they normally would expect in people that have primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Again, it didn't cure them, but it was a significant reduction in their progression of disability. Very important point. And so they're saying that hydroxychloroquine is a promising candidate for PPMS and should be investigated further in randomized control trials. So this is the first, I don't know if it's the first one, but it is one. And they are saying, well, we need to study this more because it looks like it could be a candidate. But you and I are not interested in just treating. We are interested in recovering from MS. But there are so many huge clues in this study. So number one, again, it's important to understand that there, this is not a cure. But in a year and a half, they had significant symptom improvements when there is nothing else that helps. And then what we have to do is, I know that, that what they're all trying to do is they're like, well, it's modulating the immune system. It's our immune system that's attacking our tissues. We've got to use drugs to modulate it. But actually what it is doing is like, you have to look to see what does hydroxychloroquine do? What is its purpose? Oh, it treats certain types of parasites it's used to treat protus like malaria, for example. And so then you go, okay, well, that's interesting. And maybe uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I'll talk about it in a minute. But things we have to consider is, well, maybe the dosage wasn't the right dosage. Maybe they would have benefited from a higher dosage. Or maybe hydroxychloroquine is, has anti-malarial or anti-protus properties, but maybe it would be more effective in a combination of other parasite drugs together. Maybe it's a different type of protus. Maybe it's not malaria that MS patients have. Maybe it's like a cousin. So we know that Babesia is also a protus, but it's not malaria. Like they're different. They're, they can be from different genuses and from different families, for example. But they're different parasites, but they're small, and we know that they probably are infecting red blood cells in MS patients. So again, was the dosage high enough? Would we be better off with combinations? Um, and maybe there's different treatments that would be better for the type of protus that we have in multiple sclerosis. But what I wanted to share with you is like, I've tried to pull this together as quickly as possible, and I want to go deeper, and I'll probably do another live event on this. But what's so fascinating is the history between multiple sclerosis and malaria. Fascinating. So 
There are 75 pages, actually, actually let me backtrack for a minute. So in 1899, and again, we've talked about Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease, how there are so many early studies where they found the spirochetes in MS patients, but also now they've been finding protists. So there was an old theory hypothesis from a researcher's uh, Manaberg, M-A-N-N-A-B-E-R-G, in 1899, and he believed that that MS was really caused by malaria, that that's what was causing it. So 1899, so we had reason to believe with his research. It, I'm trying to dig that up, trying to find the original, his original work, but that's challenging to find. And then there is also 75 papers dating back to the 1880s where physicians and uh, people that worked in the lab, they discovered these malaria type protus in MS patients. And actually in, so that there's a lot of studies that where they're finding the malaria type parasites in MS patients dating back to the 1880s. But then also in the 1920s and the 1930s, I didn't know this, but apparently malaria was in the United States. And so they would treat people for malaria and they found that the MS patients really did well when they used the malaria drugs. So they had significant symptom improvements in MS patients that were treated, being treated for malaria in the 1920s and the 1930s. Very, very significant. And then there is this medical doctor, Dr. Fry. He is a US doctor and he created or introduced, started this lab called Fry Labs where they do testing for doctors. They will test for various types of infections. They do DNA, DNA tests, et cetera. And this doctor discovered this single cell protist, kind of like a malaria type, Babesia type, protozoa in MS patients in, I think in most, if not all of the MS patients. And he said it was, he would like, when you try to identify, try to identify, uh, identify um, whether it's a plant or whether it's an animal or an insect, we have this genetic language or um, a classification system. And we have you know, kingdoms, families, uh, genuses, species. And so that way, across the world, we can say, well, this one type of protist, this is its first and last name, genus and species. And so he was looking and looking, and he couldn't find the one he discovered, that it had different characteristics than any other protist that has been discovered. And that's possible, because there are so many different microbes on planet. So he found this protozoa that was in multiple sclerosis patients, and he said in all, in many if not all of them, but not just in MS, but in other diseases like ALS, and, and possibly I'll have to look back at his work, but other kind of neurodegenerative diseases. So fascinating that he found that. And then we have this current study where in 2021, again, just confirming. So this is all like all this evidence that has been going on for well over 100 years, linking benefits for treating some type of a protist, a malaria, Babesia type protist with anti-malarial drugs. And so that's really, really significant. So we do see, and we just assumed that it's Babesia in our MS students that have a lot of symptoms of this. But, and I, go watch that video on Babesia after, Babesia and multiple sclerosis, the link. It would be, I believe it would be, we have playlists on our Live Disease Free YouTube channel. So you can go to the infection and multiple sclerosis playlist and you'll probably find it there. And I am uploading them to our website. So if something happens to us, then you can find us on our website. We will be using Rumble here soon too. It's just, there's only one of me and I'm trying to get everything done. The research takes a lot of work. So I wanted to talk about a few symptoms of like malaria and, and with Babesia, there are going to be a lot of common symptoms because they're, they're, they're similar parasites. They're very similar parasites. So they'll both infect our red blood cells. So there are classical, but rarely observed. So very often people will get infected and it's not picked up by doctors or even by people themselves. And there are three general stages. So sometimes we could be infected when we were a teenager and it can be chronically in our body 
And with certain circumstances, maybe, you know, high stress, unhealthy lifestyle, the overuse of antibiotics, all kinds of different factors, pregnancies, et cetera, which are good things, but they are, they are taxing on our body. So there's, so then these parasites, they are become a chronic issue and they are chronically present in us. And then there comes this tipping point where our immune system can no longer manage them. So there's this cold stage where people feel more cold and shivering. There is a hot stage where we have more fevers, headaches, vomiting, um, seizures, can have seizures in young children. And finally, a sweating stage. So this is really where we have day sweats and night sweats. And a lot of women that I work with in our Live Disease Free program that have MS and other chronic diseases, they have these day sweats and night sweats, and they assume that it's their hormones when really it is these infections. And as they treat them, they go, oh, I guess I didn't have hormone problems. So things like um, more common are fevers, chills, headaches, uh, sweats, headaches, nausea, vomiting, body aches, and just generally feeling awful. Physical findings can include elevated temperatures, perspiration, weakness. You could have an enlarged spleen, mild jaundice, enlargement of the liver, increased respiratory rate. So your heart rate could be just a little bit higher than it should be. They find these parasites in the blood. They do infect our red blood cells, but this is something that doctors are not gonna look for unless Unless you have a lot of symptoms and you say that you've traveled recently, they're not really going to be looking for this. And so what they can find is mild anemia or anemia and also decreased blood platelets and elevated bilirubin and um, uh, amino transferases, also elevation in that. And then severe malaria. So this is like chronically or maybe just, you know, it becoming a stronger infection, moving into the central nervous system also. We can get anemia. So a lot of our students have anemia. It's not the only parasite that causes anemia, but because it's really affecting our red blood cells, definitely can Im impact our, our, um, our, 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 our blood iron for sure. Uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, syndrome abnormalities and blood clotting, low blood pressure, kidney, acute kidney injury. And I know for like Babesia, I'm trying to think like a chronic cough, day sweats, night sweats, um, insomnia, mood, just stomach issues. Uh, you get these little blood, like little petechiae blood blisters, like these tiny little red dots, especially on your torso. So there's all of these different symptoms, tons of them. And unfortunately, there's overlap. But what's crazy is that as our red blood cells are infected over time and they move into the central nervous system, then we can have other symptoms where it's a lot more serious, right? So we can have things like where, um, let me go back here. I just don't want to miss any of this stuff. Uh, so... It affects our skeletal system, muscle system, so leading to symptoms like muscle aches, muscle spasms or muscles contracting, spasticity, right? What we deal with, muscle fatigue, muscle weakness, muscle pain, and also can, it, it definitely will impact our blood vessels. So it can be the main disease causing mechanism is where we have with our small capillaries, so the very small blood vessels, when you can have these red blood cells that have been parasitized by the malaria or by the Babesia, so it can actually cause a decreased delivery of oxygen because our tissue needs oxygen. So we can have obstruction and of blood flow, we can have decreased oxygen, and all of these things can really impact our tissues, our muscles, et cetera. Also things like tinnitus, like we wouldn't think that that could be connected, but that's another one. So hearing loss, tinnitus, dizziness, the symptoms honestly go on and on and on. And so if you have like where you look at your blood work from your doctor and you notice that the, the MCV, the, the mean corpuscle volume, I think that's what it's called. So your red blood cells are bigger than normal. You are dealing with anemia. You have a lot of symptoms of these like Babesia type, malaria type. That's where you have to talk to your doctor and say, hey, I've got, I've done all this research and I have all of this. And, you know, I would like you to test me to see if I have Babesia. Um, my red blood cells are, 
are infected with a Babesia. So I don't know if they can pick up this other protist that has not been identified yet by labs. I'm not sure, um, but it's worth a try. But that's what we help people to do in the uh, program is we help you because again, like stepping back now, I've just talked to you about one of the parasites that can cause. So like I was talking with my students, so for example, if they really test well for certain parasite drugs, right, and they're getting prescriptions and they're treating, but maybe like most of them do fine, but maybe there's the odd person that's like, I just don't feel well, it's just, you know, it's kind of making me feel worse. You stop and you kind of go, okay, well, maybe it's aggravating this other parasite that you have because you have a lot of other symptoms of a protist, for example. So then this is what I help students to do. And this is the hard thing because we don't have good tests. So what we notice is that when people are really sick, they will usually have worms, big and small. And these can be round worms. These can be flat worms. These can be tapeworms. But they also have bacteria. So we've talked in other videos about Clostridia, they produce nasty poisons. They're some of the most toxic bacteria. We know that. And there's other, the chlamydia and ammonia and the different Clostridia species and um, Borrelia that causes Lyme disease. So there's all kinds of bacteria. And then we also have these single cell protists. So we don't have to get too worried, like thinking, how are we ever going to figure this out? Because the nice thing is that treatments is like this treatment will kind of cover these ones. This treatment will kind of cover these ones. And then we use a layering of treatments. So we're using parasite drugs plus herbs plus oxidizing agents. So we're hitting these critters at different parts of the body in different angles. And so that's what works well. But we can't get fixated on one cause because it's never been one infection. So it could be that we have had, many of us with MS have had this protist type infection, which is causing maybe 30, 40% of our symptoms, but then maybe we also have filarial worms, but we also have fungal infections like the candida, but also the molds like aspergillus. But that's what we do is we're just knocking them back, chiseling them back, but I'll talk about the plan first, but this is so huge. When you see like a hundred years of connections, when all of this stuff is so suppressed and so censored and you still find it in the scientific literature, you know that there is a very significant link here between MS and these protist type parasites, these single cell malaria, Babesia type parasites. And so that can be one. So for example, even if we're treating the worms, right, and we're knocking back the fungus, we have to pay attention to these single cell parasites because if we do have them and we don't treat them and we still have all of these red blood cells infected and we are still lacking oxygen, this is going to hugely impact our immune function. So we can't just leave that, we have to deal with that also. But the nice thing is that the categories, there's not that many, it's like worms and fungus and bacteria and protists. And so, again, dealing with dysbiosis, but if you follow a step-by-step -step plan, and again, with the Live Disease Free plan, we have found that you cannot just pop a pill. You can't just go, I mean, you could possibly talk your doctor into getting hydroxychloroquine, and you could take that. Again, there are adverse effects of it, So, but the adverse effects of the hydroxychloroquine might be less than your primary progressive multiple sclerosis but there is a better way. There's a better way to actually, number one, in the Live Disease Free Plan, we reduce the food to these infections so that we start to feel better. We're making them less active. They produce less poisons. There's less inflammation. This is immune modulation. So we're naturally modulating the immune system. Fancy that. Then we are supporting the body, which continues to naturally modulate the immune system. Then we get to the treatment part. And this is where we are energy tested to see, you know, which herbs, which parasite drugs test the best for us because we don't have good tests. And it's really challenging to get doctors to do testing. And most of the tests will come back false negative. So then we go on a treatment plan. And you have to work with somebody because you don't know how much of the treatments to take. You don't know how to take them safely enough. You are going to run the risk of making these parasites resistant. If you take too much, you can make yourself sick. So you need to work with somebody who has skill and that's our skill. That is our talent. This is what we've become good at is helping our students to get ready to treat 
then to access the treatments, to access the care, the practitioners they need. And even if you find a practitioner, you need somebody to help you because they, they're like, sure, I'll support you, but I really have never treated parasites and I don't know, I like most of the general practitioners have it. Neurologists will never do this. Um, they, they totally believe in the MS drugs. They've been programmed to, you know, 10, 10 or more years of programming to believe they're the best option. So really, you have two options. You can, you can look for a doctor, but chances are if you start asking them questions and they probably know a little bit about treating fungus and treating things like uh, Lyme disease with antibiotics, which we haven't found to be very helpful either. So when you kind of talk to them, they have experience or not. So with our students, they actually have to respectfully guide and direct their practitioners because their practitioners are learning. And I hope that someday we can actually have lots of practitioners all over the world. This has been suppressed from them. That's why they don't know. We now have this healthcare system that is very specialized and very compartmentalized. We have oncologists, we have gastroenterologists, we have epidemiologists, we have all of these like general practitioners, neurologists, we have so many different specialists, medical specialists, but when you actually simplify health, you'll see that you probably don't need all of these different practitioners if you let them all practice what they should practice. That is like getting people to eat right, getting people to support their body in various ways, looking to see what is out of balance in their micro, mi microbiome and helping to correct that and, and helping them to live a healthy lifestyle. And that's how the wellness champions are recovering from multiple sclerosis and other chronic diseases. And you don't need 15 to, or 100 different specialists, right? Because it just, like if the parasites are in one part of the body or a different part of the body, the do same doctor can treat it. They just have to know how to treat. And a long time ago, there were powers that be that basically decided that you know it'd be a lot more lucrative if we separate all these doctors, separate, compartmentalize all of this healthcare, and then we have very specific treatments for very specific conditions, but they're all immune suppressive drugs in chronic disease, that they're all suppressing our immune system, which makes us a lot worse in time. So, uh, that's what I wanted to share with you today. We will, I, again, I will be creating a blog post on livediseasefree.com. Make sure you subscribe so you get our newsletters. Make sure you uh, subscribe on our YouTube channel so that you'll know when I'm releasing the next training. And this really helps you, like I'll be posting all of the different references that I've been looking at, amazing research, amazing studies linking for the past 100 years, this link between multiple sclerosis, patients benefiting from anti-malaria treatments. So if that's been going on for over 100 years, even with all of the censorship, we need to look there because that is one of the helpful treatments. And then we need to consider like, okay, so, what is the best way to get these chronic infections that have gone all the way into our central nervous system? What is the best way to treat them? And that is why we have found this layering of, th of therapies and treatments, and we continue to learn all the time. And again, I have to give all the glory to God because I, I keep begging him for help, and he keeps showing us all of these amazing insights, and I really believe it's his wisdom because he doesn't want you or myself to suffer like this. So there is going to be a change in healthcare. Unfortunately, it is not going to be right away. You don't have to wait. If you are someone who's like, man, this is interesting, but I so new to me, then watch my videos. Start to change your diet. I've got lots of videos on YouTube. Live disease-free. Change your diet. Start to feel better, start to learn about the infections. And when you're ready, when you feel like I'm ready, I this makes perfect sense to me, then you can join. We just had a brand new um, student join today, one yesterday. We've served people in over 15 countries. It doesn't matter where you live, what your time zone is. I We help you to get ready to treat, to get the treatments, to get access to all the care that you need. That is our goal. And that is what we do. That is what we love to do because we have recovered from chronic disease like myself. And that is the greatest thrill is to help other people get their health and their life back also. I'm going to look at a couple of different questions that you have here and your comments. Please put your comments in the 
in the box. We do answer them. I will post my masterclass training. So if you want more information about the Live Disease Free Plan, what the students are doing to recover, we have lots of success stories on our website, livediseasefree.com, uh, and also on Live Disease Free, the YouTube channel. So listen to the successes, watch the videos, learn about the infections, start to make changes, start to feel better. And when you're ready to treat, if you need support, that's what we can help you do in the plan. And then you would watch my masterclass training to find out all the specifics about the steps we take, case studies, and how we can help you, how we can support you through this process. Hi, Maurice. Good evening. Toxicity is what happens in the body, but it's, yes. And there are some really strong toxins in our environment right now, absolutely. And we have to know about them. We have to know how to manage the toxins, how to live in this world when there is so many toxins. But what's causing the disease is chronic infections in the body. And protists, these single cell parasites that are found in MS are one of the categories of problem. Absolutely. Hi, Brian. So nice to see you there. And Paulette, hello. Good evening. Hello, Facebook user. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Brian. Okay. So Pam, you have numbness in your feet and your hands. What do you do? I'm sorry, I don't know what your name is, but the numbness in your feet and hands is caused by inflammation. So you're, and we've talked in previous videos about inflammation is your immune system is fighting something. It's fighting an, an enemy. And the enemy is a type of infection, unless you were in a car accident. If you were in a car accident or you fell off your bike, that's a different type of inflammation. But the inflammation in chronic disease is caused by infections. That is the definition of inflammation. It's that your immune system is, it's the result, it's kind of like the war. So think of inflammation as the war. It is the product of your immune system fighting infection. We talked about one of the infections that's really common in MS patients. So how to get well from the numbness, how to get that inflammation down, is that you have to treat those infections. If you don't, you will continue to have more and more symptoms. You will continue to have more and more disability in time. Yes, if we eat super healthy and if we exercise and we don't have stress and we don't take antibiotics, we do all these wonderful things, we can slow down the progression of the disease very often. But we find that a lot of students, like they end up with bladder issues and they end up with these bladder infections and they have to use antibiotics. So there's no way that they can not do antibiotics. And stress, unfortunately, it's part of life. So your better option is to treat. That way you have recovery and you can possibly have full recovery, a lot of people do. And then that way you are treating the cause, you are enjoying the highest level of health that you can in your life. And then you have that skill. So you manage your microbes for the rest of your life. And that's the only reason that I have been able to live MS free for over 30 years because I've learned that skill. And you are gonna be exposed to other parasites in the future. That's just part of living on planet earth. But once you know how to treat them once or twice a year, once you're well, you can make sure you never end up in this position again. Hi, MLK, you had dizziness and migraines after COVID. Then you took um, this drug called I, and actually I can talk about it because I know that doctors are prescribing it in different countries, but it has just been so controversial in the past. But I've shared a research study that it has helped for MS too, the eye drug. Um, so you used it for a month and the dizziness stopped. Interesting. So, and that drug is a parasite drug. So do you think that it was a coincidence and when I stopped taking the it, the dizziness came back. So I don't know what dose you were taking, but obviously it was definitely discouraging one of the parasites that is causing the inflammation, the dizziness that you're dealing with. Absolutely. And sometimes it's it could even be that that you had other parasites that the that drug was treating kind of but it didn't treat it well enough because you didn't take it long enough or maybe the dose wasn't high enough either but we have not found that just taking the drug that starts with an i that it cured ms 
we find that students usually test well for three to five parasite drugs at one time. Um, but it can be helpful. So it's not a coincidence at all. It is one of the parasite drugs that is most commonly prescribed, but in combination with other drugs. But if you just take that drug hoping to recover from MS, you will be very sad because it just doesn't work. If it would, I would tell you. I would write a book and I would be done, right? But it's not that easy. It, and the parasite drugs on their own are not a magic cure. This is where we have to use like talk more about dysbiosis. So that, that drug is not gonna treat any type of protist. It's not gonna knock back fungus. It's only gonna treat certain worms, not all worms. And that's the problem. There will never be a single MS cure. I mean, if you had something like ozone that you could completely sterilize your whole body, but it would kill you. But that's the only thing that, cause ozone is stronger. But if you're just putting it in your blood or you're doing rectal encephalation, it's not going to treat or reach the central nervous system well enough. So it's not gonna be strong enough to recover. So that's why we have to consider, like the first step in recovery is like really understanding what you're dealing with. And that's why I do all of this research. It's, it's to help people, it's to try to create change, to try to get people talking in a different direction. My hope is that you will share this video with other people. Please share it. You are the foot soldiers. You are the people that are helping to get this research out. And if I could honestly, if we could have doctors treating these parasites in my lifetime, I would be so thrilled if this could be taken over. I could do something else. There's lots of things I could do. Playing with my grandkids. I'm a teacher. Lots of things I could do. But we have to get this research out. So please share this research with different MS groups. It's very, very important because people need hope. They need to know that there is an option for them. So that little improvement that you had in your dizziness, I hope that helps you to have more confidence in what I am saying is true. Hi, Allison from New Zealand. So nice. Here with Brian too. So awesome. Hi, Brian. It is hot here. It's, uh, it's hot in my place too. Hopefully I'm not sweating too much. We're having a heat wave here. Hi, Mary. Does this solution supersede Ocrevus treatments for primary progressive multiple sclerosis? That is a really good question. So Ocrevus, I would like you to research this. I'm not a doctor. I can't give medical advice, but I can give you, I'm an educator. I'm a teacher. Ocrevus is an old chemo drug and it's being repurposed for MS and other chronic diseases. And what it does is it, it really depletes your body of B cells. And your B cells are immune cells that they're like your soldiers that protect you from infection. So this is an old chemotherapy drug. It's attacking your soldiers. It's depleting them. It's making you more susceptible to other infections. It is not treating the infections that you're dealing with at all. And so please look up the adverse effects. Cancer, like aggressive breast cancer is one of them. So although it's making somebody a whole lot of money because it's being billed out at over $100,000 per year, the neurologists are getting very significant kickbacks on prescribing these drugs. There's apparently places you can look to see where they're reporting on how much they're getting paid for prescribing these medications. And they're getting all kinds of perks. So there's a financial incentive to, to prescribe them. The pharmaceutical companies are making a ton of money and I'm not against pharmaceutical drugs. They're like, we sometimes use parasite drugs to recover. But if you continue to take this, you will still have your multiple sclerosis. And when we take these immunosuppressive drugs, in the long run, we are worse off, we are weaker, we are more susceptible to other infections, which will cause other diseases like cancer. And it's a horrible, horrible thing. I was just talking to one gentleman today who wants to join us. He's just in his 20s. He had his first infusion of Ocrevus and he has been sick for several weeks, really sick. He can only eat once a day. And it makes sense if you're just infested with these different types of parasites and then you're suppressing your immune system even further, does that make sense? I don't think so. It doesn't make any sense to me. So please, Mary, research that. 
The only option for primary progressive if you want to recover is to treat the cause. So with our live disease free plan, it doesn't matter what, just research it. It doesn't matter what type of MS you have, whether it's primary, primary progressive, secondary progressive, relapsing, remitting, the isolated incident, the, the one attack. It is, those different types of MS are really like, determined more by your environment. So is your immune system strong enough to give you a break to kind of knock them back a bit and to, to kind of bring back stability? Or, or is your immune system really taxed by the infections by your environment and you don't get breaks and you get a continual decline in your health? So that's what it has more to do with. So the, the treating of the parasites, it's exactly the same for MS with the Live Disease Free Plan. Please research that drug. My heart goes out to all the poor people that are taking it. I really worry. Um, I worry about the future, other diseases. It's brutal what we're doing to MS patients. I just, it's awful. Hello, hi Roseanne, hi Kevin. So last week, Kevin learned that the parasite that causes malaria is actually infecting the red blood cells. Yes, so um, the Babesia and malaria, like they all infect our red blood cells. And that's really important to know because if we don't treat them, we still have infected red blood cell. And that affects our health on so many different levels, which we talked about. So I don't know. So like Dr. Klinger talks about Babesia. He finds it very commonly in MS patients. They're quite challenged. Babesia is quite challenging to treat. But again, if you just go and try to treat Babesia, if you have multiple sclerosis, you might have some symptom improvement, but you're probably not going to get well. Like I'm sure you won't because our students are testing well for three to five parasite drugs. And with knowing about the filarial worms, the small round worms in the central nervous system, knowing for like years and years about Borrelia, the Lyme infections, knowing about the Candida, and then now knowing about the also the Protus, it's not just one infection. So it's what your goal is. If you want to just take one drug and have a little bit of symptom improvement and live with the disease, you know, it might help you more than the MS drugs. But if you want to like, no, I want to see how much recovery I can get back. I want to get back to doing the things I love to do. If that's your motive, if that's your goal, then you want to treat the, the three to five big diseases that are causing your symptoms. Yes, and that's really important. Kevin is saying that when we talk about parasite, we literally assume worms, and that's not the case. A parasite is any microbe that lives in you and causes you harm. So different types of worms can cause you harm. Different types of bacteria, protus, and fungi, moles, and yeast can also cause you harm. They live in us, they eat our food, they produce poisons, they cause us harm. So they are all parasites. Um, you've had high M, or MVC, uh, mean volume or whatever it is, like it's basic, your, your red blood cells are bigger than they should be. And anemia can be li linked with that. So I know, so I know that they give vitamin B12 and it's fine to take some sublingual methylcobalamin, but it's not, like if you're eating meat, you should be getting vitamin B12. So that's probably not what's causing it. And some doctors are like, oh, you're just different. Like you, your, your um, blood, red blood cell test results are a little bit out of the normal range, but that's just you. And it's like, no, you just don't know what to look for. You just don't know what it is. Um, so so, uh, so, I don't know. So you, you had that for a while, used B12, and the, you said the doctor cut that back. I'm not sure if that helped you or not. You can take vitamin B12. People take vitamin D3, but they still have MS, right? Um, you've had bad sweats, headaches. You thought that it was going through the change. I know a lot of us Paulette women think that it is our hormones. And even um, if people are still having their menses, the two weeks before your periods, that's where progesterone is higher. And this is where 
there's changes in our body. We can have a higher blood sugar level, which will feed these critters. We can have a suppression of our immune, inflammatory immune response. So we can have a lot more symptoms in the two weeks before our men's season. We call that PMS, but really it's the parasites are a lot more active then. So will this work with people with HIV? Absolutely. So what you're doing with this program is you are helping to do everything and for health. And honestly, the biggest thing is that it is huge for HIV, like if you can correct your microbiome, like really, really huge, all right? And this is even for different viruses like hepatitis, for example. People can become symptom-free of all kinds of these like viruses. And if they not only, and with eating right, there's so many versions of eating right, like what is the right way to eat? It's like looking at your symptoms, looking at your microbiome, and if you have a lot of symptoms of parasites, going low carb is really the biggest help. So lots of low carb vegetables, moderate amounts of meat, that's a live disease free diet and enough healthy fat to maintain your weight. We have a guide, guidelines for the live disease free diet in our live disease free community on Facebook. Also go to our website, live disease free. There's a blog post. I think, um, you can find the best diet for MS, but I say it's for MS because I reach a lot of people with MS, but it's for anyone that is dealing with parasite symptoms. So yes, it is not disease specific. It is not going to help only specific people. This is really helping you to learn how to determine if you are out of balance with the good and bad microbes, the good being health promoting, the bad being parasites, and how to restore balance. And that's the missing link of the wellness puzzle. This is what we're missed. Um, looking to see here if there's any questions, lots of comments, please keep the comments in, I love it. Is it okay to take iron supplement when you're on the diet? So if you are anemic, then you do have to build up your iron because that really impacts your recovery. It impacts your energy, your health. But we just don't take the really large, like the pharmaceutical grade, very high dose of iron. It's severely constipating and makes you feel awful nauseous. So there's lots of health food store. Uh, one company is on our website, Ortho Iron. That one has been really good in the past for, for myself and for our students like it. So finding just a good um, iron supplement, if you're anemic, absolutely, you have to correct that. Hi, Suzanne. Thank you for your comment. So uh, Mary, you're exhausted. Every doctor says it's due to P the primary progressive multiple sclerosis. So what I would say is like, if this is the first time you found me, start to follow my stuff. Look at the diet. There's a whole playlist on the diet. Get the guidelines. Start to change your diet you will start to feel better getting the carbs down. You'll be shocked. And then if you, when you're ready, if you research the infections and you kind of put your feelers out and you're like, man, Pam's right, it's really hard to find somebody that can help me. If you need support, that's what we do. Your life is worth it. I was talking to a young man today in his 20s, living by, his, by himself, and I think he has no family left. And he's to the point, he's like, Pam, if I don't treat these infections, I'm gonna end up in a care home. Like he's so sick with the multiple sclerosis. So it's like he's still working barely, he's a, working from home, but if he doesn't treat at 20, mid 20s, it's brutal and it doesn't have to be that way. And he was just treated or he was just diagnosed very, very recently. So what you have to do is you have to get your belief up. You have to research this to show you that I am telling you the truth. And then you have to find a way to treat these parasites. And if you need help, if you want to do it as quickly as possible, that is what we do. So you were recently diagnosed, I'm sorry, uh, Young, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. You were recently diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Um, you have converted to a strict dairy-free whole Keto diet, good that you're off of dairy also. So keto is good because it's low carb, but the dairy is very important. You've also cut out nicotine in your life and you've dropped it like a cold turkey. I'm so proud of you. I wonder if you've already had some symptom improvements. You should let me know. You're so very welcome, Mary. Like... The reason that we are not treating infection in MS is because there is no money 
there's no profit in treating multiple sclerosis by treating the cause, the parasites. There are, you know, like a, every year, like at least over, well, you do the Ocrevus once every six months. So that's, every infusion is about 100,000 from what I've he heard. So you're looking at, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of dollars and people are suffering terribly. And I'm so sorry that you're suffering terribly. I really hope and pray that you will look into this. T cells are the soldiers, B cells are the instigators. That is not true, that you need your B cells. You need to research on your B cells a little bit more. Your, they all have different duties in protecting you. And the T, and some say that, so why is it that some of the MS drugs are suppressing our T cells? So like some of them will do TN B cells, some, will, some of them will just go after B cells. So why is there no consistency with MS treatments? You need to start asking questions. A lot of our students that, you know, when they were working with neurologists, that when they got diagnosed, they're given a list of drugs, here you pick one. And they're like, I'm not a doctor, how am I supposed to pick a drug? Like how am I, do you not know what would be better for me? How is this possible? So the B cells are not the instigators. When you treat the infections, you'll notice you don't have any of these symptoms anymore. So there are so many people that I have talked to that have multiple sclerosis that have chosen not to use the disease modifying drugs because they feel better when they're not using them than when they're using them. They have figured out that it's not helping the MS and it's making them feel worse. I'm not telling you what you should do, but I'm just telling you, you need to research. Yes, tinnitus is another sense, it's another symptom. So MLK, that is, a, tinnitus is another symptom of inflammation caused by these infections, for sure. Um, awesome, so there's more, there are more comments. Please submit them. And I'm just going to let you guys go. We've almost gone an hour here. So what I want to do is get the word out. Please help us to share this research. You could even share this video. You can share, go and check out livediseasefree.com. It will be posted by Friday morning at the latest, tomorrow or Friday morning, the new blog post with all of the links for these studies. Share this with other communities, with other MS communities. Start talking about these infections. Help us to get the word out. And if you have chronic disease, MS or other, watch my videos, start to change your diet, start to implement the steps I've shared and watch my masterclass training. And if you need support in treating these infections, that's what we can help you to do. So watch my masterclass training when you're ready, if you need support. And that is where I can help you to treat these infections, to have more recovery than you thought possible, maybe full recovery, and get back to doing the things you love to do. So take care and bye-bye for now.